Hello friends and family and welcome to our boring meditation stuff, September 24th. I hope that the previous video wasn't too uh, heavy. <laughs> um, I think that it's a serious topic and I hope I treated it seriously. Um, this video is a sort of follow-on to that um, and it is uh, going to be rooted in a bit of a story. Um, the idea that our lives have some effect on the world is, is a bit of a paradox, unless we're, you know, Lincoln or um, Alexander the Great, uh, Ashoka. Unless we're someone like this, it's difficult to say, oh, well, the, the actions I performed in my life, they're going to have these, these ripple effects. Um, they're going to matter a thousand years from now, even a hundred years from now. And it's easy sometimes to become a bit nihilistic about our existence and our significance. And so the story I have is actually about when I lived in India the first time. This was about 15 years ago. I made some friends and I found the environment in India um, wildly different <laughs> than it was in Canada or the United States and not not because India is, is a very religious country or because it has such amazing history um, or because of its incredible plurality. Uh, I was a bit of a doofus at the age of 25. And what I found was I was very surprised at um, people's reluctance to drink and smoke. <laughs> and you know, enjoy themselves. And because I didn't know any better, I actually invested real energy in convincing my friends to do these things, to go out and to stay out late and to drink and to smoke. And, um, it didn't seem significant at all at the time, and at the time it probably wasn't very significant. But I returned to India uh, about seven or eight years later, uh, maybe less, <laughs> and I realized because of that gap, we don't usually get the gap. We don't, we don't have a gap with our children, with our parents, with our spouse, um, where we can say, oh, okay, well, it was 2005, right? And then seven years go by, now it's 2012. What's happened in between? And in between, I was quite surprised to see that the impression I had made on these friends was significant and that now they were the ones um, convincing other people that they should stay out late and that they should smoke and drink and quote unquote enjoy themselves and this series of effects would no doubt carry on um, that someone else would be influenced and someone else would be influenced. And even if it's only for one micro generation, one seven year window, uh, it's still significant in those people's lives. And it was, I mean, it seems obvious in retrospect that people behave this way and that people have these sorts of responses. But I was quite surprised and I 
also found myself falling out of love with these things around the same time, smoking and drinking. And um, it made me quite sad to know that in particular for one of my friends, that he was now addicted to cigarettes, that he was a smoker and he felt he could never get away from smoking. Um, now that's certainly not the sort of impression that a person wants to leave in their life. And this idea of what we leave behind is, I, I think that the more romantically shaped <laughs> meditative practices or philosophical practices point to these images of a pond, right? And you throw a small stone into the pond, or you throw a large boulder into the pond, and the waves ripple outward. Eventually they quiet down, but there's always a set of waves, and they interact with other waves in the pond. So this imagery is, I think, sensible imagery. This is sort of how our lives operate. We have a wake behind us, the things we've said, the things we've done, and curiously enough, the things we've thought, have an effect on the people around us now, but also in the future. The wake travels into the future. And these are the sorts of actions that we should concern ourselves with. How can we temper these actions? How can we work on a system of ethics that's meaningful for us? Not some prescribed system of ethics, but an individual system of ethics. What do we think is important on the level of all humanity and on the level of the individual. And how can we exact that? How can we implement that for ourselves? And there is, I've mentioned this before, but there is this sort of three-stage visualization of um, meditation within the tradition that I am recommending to friends and, and to family in these videos, which is um, working backward, Vipassana meditation as a kind of conclusion, Anapana meditation as the sort of middle step. And the first step is actually ethics, to say to oneself, okay, I I won't kill, obviously, I won't kill other human beings, but that I, I will work to not kill any creature. I'm going to try my hardest not to smash mosquitoes or step on ants or, um, you know. <laughs> I, I, some people, some acquaintances I have here in India, smash lizards house lizards and I always find that I find it difficult when I would actively try to kill creatures in my house in India I would find it difficult to kill a cockroach I can't imagine killing a lizard that's like killing a small chicken um, that we can grab hold of this idea that we shouldn't be lying to anyone for any reason. That honesty, transparency, that these virtues have real value in and of themselves. That is described as a foundation to your Anapana meditation. And consequently, it becomes what you leave behind. When you die, your actions, based on your system of ethics, will be 
what remains, the consequences of those actions. And so I think it's valuable to reflect on this idea, to reflect on the consequences, and to think about how do we really want to spend our time? Not in some grandiose sense, not what is my career, what is my purpose in life? Because it seems like those things actually don't matter that much. It doesn't matter if you become some CEO of some big corporation. It doesn't matter if you become a big, important politician. It matters more, whatever your path through the planet, whatever it happens to be, whatever people you happen to interact with, what choices you make and how do you act in every situation that you don't wake up every morning regretting what you did yesterday. Oh, I shouldn't have behaved this way. Oh, I shouldn't have gotten angry. Oh, it was pointless to get sad. That we are constantly working ourselves away from that and toward behaviors and thought patterns which we feel are worth our time and that we are spending each day on those small behaviors that we think are the most significant. This whole idea might seem very obvious, I think, to my friends and family, the people who are watching this video. I have a feeling if it sits on the internet for years and years, random people will stumble on it and they'll think, well, oh, maybe this is insightful or maybe this is painfully obvious and why is this guy even saying these things? Um, all of you who uh, do know me personally and closely, I, I actually think that you all do this very well already. You spend your time with family, with friends, with neighbors, and um, with the sort of levity that makes those interactions meaningful, the wake <laughs> as it were, that will follow you into the future is, um, is already quite positive. And so I want to be careful not to frame this in terms of, oh, you get away from this really negative thing, like you're going to turn people into alcoholics and smokers and whatever else. And to focus on the fact that even if you already feel that your days are spent in the best possible way with your grandchildren and with your children and with your neighbors, with your community, that you can always grow that. It can always be stronger. And um, that ethics as a foundation to meditation will always enable that for you. Again, Make sure that you're experimenting. Make sure that you are using your own judgment and your own empiricism to see if this is true for you. But this has been my experience. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope that you are all taking good care of yourselves and taking good care of everyone around you. And I will talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye.